Confidential Book 405127 U651 Interrogation of Crew September 1941 Naval Intelligence Division The following report is compiled from information derived from prisoners of war. The statements made cannot always be verified. They should therefore not be accepted as facts unless they are definitely stated to be confirmed by information from other sources. Table of Contents Section 1. Introductory Remarks Section 2. Crew of U-651 Section 3. Early History of U-651 4. First and Last Crews of U-651 5. Sinking of U-651 6. Details of U-651 7. Other U-Boats 8. U-Boat Construction 9. U-Boat Losses 10. Technical Information 11. U-Boat Bases 12. Depot Ships 13. Staff of U-Boat Organization in Kiel 14. U-Boat Training 15. Naval Establishments in Occupied Territory 16. U-Boat Tactics 17. General Remarks on U-Boats 18. Remarks on Mines and Mine Sweeping 19. Miscellaneous Appendices 1. Observation Book 2. List of Crew of U-651 Interrogation of Crew of U-651, a 500-ton U-boat, sunk at about 0730 on Sunday, 29th June, 1941, in position 59 degrees by 51 north, 18 degrees by 37 west. Section 1. Introductory Remarks As mentioned in the introductory remarks of the reports on the interrogation of prisoners of war from U-138, Charlie Baker, 405125, and U-556, Charlie Baker, 405126, it was decided to include in each report all matter appertaining to the U-boat concerned, and to include in the last of these three reports all general information obtained from all prisoners. The information concerning other U-boats, construction, losses, bases, and general information have been collated and included in this third report on prisoners of war interrogated at the same time. Some prisoners from German supply ships were also interrogated. These men included a midshipman who had served in a U-boat, but had been wounded and transferred to a supply ship. He was made prisoner when this ship was intercepted by British naval forces. Information obtained from these sources has also been included in this report. Section 2. Crew of U-651 the six officers and 39 petty officers and men of U-651 formed one of the most fanatically Nazi and truculent crews interrogated for many months. Some of the more than usually unpleasant characteristics were thought to have been due partly to the teaching and example of the captain, and partly to the extent to which Nazi propaganda had been applied and the hold which it had obtained upon the imagination of these men. It was established that this crew had received a weekly lecture on security and on the line of conduct to be followed in the event of capture. It appears that at the time they were imbued with a highly exaggerated idea of their personal dignity and importance as Germans in general and as members of the armed forces in particular. They had all been lectured on the details of the International Convention of July 1929 relative to the treatment of prisoners of war. Thus, 
They had become a set of sea lawyers and attempted to argue on every possible pretext. They had a lively sense of privilege and not the slightest sense of obligation. Captain Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Peter Lohmeyer, aged 30 years, was born in Zanzibar. At the age of 16, he went straight from school to the merchant service, joining as a seaman, where he served for seven years. He then joined the Navy and was absolved from some preliminary training on account of his experience in the merchant service. He served in the naval air arm during the Spanish War and transferred to U-boats after the outbreak of the present war. He was at times a somewhat troublesome prisoner and extremely security conscious. His aggressive manner changed to apologetic concern when he was given to understand that his behavior, though entertaining, would result in the loss of various amenities and in the application of a stricter discipline to his whole crew. Like all his officers and men, he was a fervent Nazi, almost unable to listen to any other point of view, and utterly incapable of reasoned argument. The first lieutenant, Oberleutnant zur See, Lieutenant Karl Josef Heinrich, was an extremely unpleasant person, uncouth and ill-informed, and made every effort to be a general nuisance. Both he and the engineer officer, Engineer Lieutenant Benno Brandt, believed that they were furthering the cause of Hitler's new order by making innumerable minor complaints and by attempting to bully sentries and others who were unfortunate enough to have come in contact with them. These officers were not of the officer class and only slightly educated. They felt insulted when asked their religion, Heinrich stating that he had no time for all that tomfoolery, but adding later he was vaguely a God-believer, Gott glaub ich. Brandt professed to be a German believer, Deutsche glaub ich, which he thought a still more advanced state of mind, immeasurably superior to the possession of a faith in God, who after all had started life as the Jewish Jehovah. This officer was considered by everyone who came in contact with him to be the worst specimen of a prisoner encountered in this war. U-651 carried three midshipmen whose suitability for U-boats was being tested. They were Feinrich zur See, Gustav Adolf Schutze, Georg Sturenberg, and Wilhelm Schneider. They were scarcely of officer class, had been educated in the Nazi creed from the age of about 12 or 13 and were consequently almost illiterate and lacking any personality whatsoever. They had no knowledge of history and not even a smattering of English or French. They gave the impression of only having learnt a little reading and less writing. Their conversation consisted of propaganda quotations which they did not fully understand and which they frequently introduced in the wrong place. They had apparently had very little home life or parental influence, and later only inadequate naval training. They did not even know how to stand to attention, nor how to address a superior officer. The deterioration since the beginning of the war in the type of U-boat officer was more marked in the case of U-651 than in any batch of naval prisoners recently examined. Section 3 Early History of U-651 U-651 was the first U-boat to be built by the Hovelswerke Hamburg and was stated to have been the first of a series of about six to eight 500 ton U-boats numbered consecutively from U-651 upwards. Prisoners professed not to know at what date U-651 was laid down, but they admitted that engine room personnel was drafted towards the end of November 1940, when the U-boat was still on the slips to stand by the U-boat during the final stages of construction. Further members of the crew joined the U-boat during the following months. U-651 
was launched about the end of December 1940, or early in January 1941, and was commissioned on 12th February 1941. NID Note It is believed that the Hohlwaldswerke Hamburg started building U-boats in February 1940. Thus, U-651 would have taken about 12 months to build from the date when she was laid down to the date of commissioning for trials and 16 months up to the date of leaving on her first war cruise. Soon afterwards, she proceeded through the Kiel Canal to Kiel, where various engine trials were made. At the end of February, or early in March 1941, U-651 proceeded to Danzig, from which base she carried out trials for about six weeks. When in harbor, the crew lived in the depot ship Iberia, according to their own statements. During these trials, minor defects were observed, one being the leakage of air bubbles from high-pressure air bottles stowed externally. Prisoners stated that the U-boat went to Gottenhafen early in April 1941, and while there the crew lived in the depot ship Wilhelm Bauer. They claimed to have seen six to eight U-boats at Gottenhafen. A series of practice attacks on a convoy were carried out, the convoy consisting of six to eight ships, including Wilhelm Bauer. These practices included daytime attacks at periscope depth and surface attacks at night. Prisoners denied having ever practiced the lowering of a torpedo from the container on the upper deck to the interior of the U-boat. They insisted that this container had remained empty. Prisoners said that U-651 returned to Kiel about 20th April 1941 for two days and then proceeded through the Kiel Canal to Hamburg, where she underwent a thorough overhaul at the Hobartswerke. It was necessary to remove the periscope as sand had got into the bearings. It was stated that U-651 left Hamburg about 15th May 1941 for Kiel. It is known that she received 50 potash cartridges from the naval dockyard at Kiel on 2nd June 1941. Section 4. First and Last Cruise of U-651 Before leaving the harbor, the captain read to the crew a special lecture on security and warned them of the pitfalls of interrogation should they be captured. It was established that U-651 cast off from the Tirpitzmole and left Kiel on her first and last cruise on 7th June 1941, accompanied by a minesweeper, and as she had completed 210 miles by midnight on that date, she must have left about dawn. Prisoners stated that she carried four torpedoes in her tubes and seven spares, four being below and two above the floor plates on the forward compartment and one in a container on the upper deck. Of these 11 torpedoes, 10 were said to have been electric and only one an air torpedo. U-651 proceeded through the Great Belt and it is estimated that she was near the island of Lesu at midnight on 7th June. And the following day, the U-boat averaged over 13 knots and traveled 330 miles and dived only once for a short time as aircraft was reported, later believed to have been German. On 9th June, she did 60 miles on the surface, but proceeded for a considerable distance, possibly about 30 miles, submerged. It is known that she was off the Norwegian coast making for Bergen, and that she was only 15 miles away from that harbor at midnight on the day in question. U-651 arrived at Bergen very early in the morning of 10th June 1941. While in this port, the crew of U-651 lived ashore in the Hotel Victoris, according to their statements. They claimed to have seen four or five escort vessels, 
a little smaller than torpedo boats in harbor. These were said to be armed with an 8.8 centimeter gun. Prisoners admitted that U-651's air compressor aft and a fuel injector had become defective and that these minor repairs were carried out at Bergen. U-651 was known to have proceeded for seven miles on the surface on 11th June 1941, and she may have done a short trial on completing her minor repairs. She left Bergen on the morning of 12th June to continue her cruise. One prisoner said that he saw a small U-boat, 250 or 300 ton type, arriving at Bergen as U-651 left. On the first day, she traveled 100 miles on the surface and 40 miles submerged. On 13th June, she remained mainly on the surface, doing 190 miles, and submerged for 2 miles only. On 14th June, the U-boat did 176 miles on the surface with 4 miles submerged. 150.5 on the surface and 9.5 submerged on 15th June, on which day destroyers were sighted at 1637 and at 1918. A diary stated that depth charges and the explosion of a torpedo were heard in the distance. U-651 completed 133 miles on the surface and 9.5 miles submerged on 16th June 1941. Entries in an observation book reproduced in Appendix A show only uninteresting facts for the next four days. Only two incidents were noted in a diary kept by a prisoner. The first was an alleged attack by an aircraft at 0530 German time on 18th June 1941 when six bombs were stated to have been dropped. An observation book noted that U-651 surfaced at 15.45 German time. NID note. Aircraft D of 269 Squadron attacked a U-boat at 03.45 on 18th June 1941 in position 61 degrees by 48 north and 22 degrees by 35 west. Three 250-pound anti-submarine bombs were dropped without visible effect. The second incident was an attack by U-651 on an inward-bound tanker proceeding independently and noted by the diarist as having a displacement of 12,000 tons at 1400 German time on 20th June 1941. Two electric torpedoes fired from periscope depth were said to have missed. It was added that U-651 then dived to about 30 to 40 meters 98.4 to 131.2 feet, and remained submerged for some time. NID note, no report has been received of any attack which could be connected with this alleged incident. Prisoners stated that on a date between 20th and 24th June 1941, probably on 22nd June, another German U-boat was sighted and approached sufficiently close for the two captains to have a conversation through megaphones. The other U-boat was described as having been homeward bound owing to a shortage of oil fuel. An entry in a diary noted that at 1745 German time, on Tuesday 24th June 1941, a convoy of 42 ships was sighted, of which three ships were sunk, amounting to roughly 20,000 tons. NID note. The only ship sunk in the evening of 24th June 1941 was SS Brockley Hill, number 35, 5,297 tons, sunk at 2105 in position 51 degrees by 13 north and 37 degrees by 21 west. She was in convoy Howe X ray 133, consisting of 58 ships and was sunk by torpedo. According to prisoners, three torpedoes were fired at intervals of a few seconds, and the Germans were told by their captain that two or even three ships had been sunk. 
Several men were certain that they had heard the explosions of two torpedoes. Prisoners stated that the convoy was bound for England. It was added that U-651 dived to 30 meters, 98.4 feet, immediately after firing her torpedoes and made off. The crew claimed to have heard explosions of depth charges in the distance. When the U-boat surfaced later, the convoy was said to have been out of sight, but two ships were described as lying damaged with some escort vessels standing by. Prisoners stated that U-651 then turned south. NID note. SS Brockley Hill did not sink at once. Whilst survivors were being recovered by another ship, Ottawa and Collingwood carried out an anti-submarine search in the area, but failed to obtain contact. There is no evidence to show that any depth charges were dropped at this time. On 26th June 1941, an entry in the observation book noted that at 2350 a Sunderland flying boat was sighted, also some smoke. On 27th June 1941, a destroyer was sighted at 0345 and at 0830 a steamer was sighted. U-651 submerged at 0842 and did not surface again until 1720. Prisoners stated that the longest period they had remained submerged was about 21 hours. It is believed that the above period is the occasion referred to. It was added that the men became tired more quickly and had some difficulty in breathing. One man said that bad weather had necessitated this long time below the surface. The masts of a convoy were sighted against the afterglow on 28th June 1941, and U-651 kept them in sight. The suggestion that the approach of this convoy had been signaled to them by the Admiral U-boats was denied. The First Lieutenant subsequently described the disposition of the escort estimating it as consisting of nine or twelve ships and adding that the convoy had eight columns of merchant ships. NID note, Convoy HX-133 had in point of fact nine columns of ships. By the date in question, it consisted of 45 ships and 12 escorts. Prisoners stated that U-651 penetrated the screen at periscope depth and fired two electric torpedoes in quick succession. The Germans claimed to have seen the large splash of water caused by one of the torpedoes hitting SS Greyburn. NID note. Greyburn, number 92 in convoy HX-133, was torpedoed at 0230 on 29th June 1941 on the port side and sank in position 59 degrees by 52 north and 18 degrees by 36 west. Almost immediately after firing her torpedoes, U-651 came into collision with a ship in the convoy, merchant vessel Anadara, number 83. Only slight damage to the after part of the U-boat's hull was admitted. This damage seems to have become more serious later. Section 5. Sinking of U-651 Immediately after the collision, U-651 dived to 120 meters, 393.7 feet, according to prisoners. Note, this statement should be accepted with great reserve. It could not be ascertained at precisely what moment the first attack by depth charges occurred, as prisoners made apparently sincere though contradictory statements, but they agreed that the first attack did most damage. The lights were extinguished, necessitating the switching on of the emergency lighting system. A water gauge, Wasserstandglas, in the control room burst. Tank number three became damaged and could no longer be blown. Water penetrated into the after part of the U-boat in increasing quantities, and she went down by the stern. The main auxiliary pumps became defective and leaked. After the first depth charge attack, 
U651 was stated to have gone still deeper to 160 meters, 525 feet. Subsequent depth charges did less damage than the first attack, but affected the nerves of the crew. Prisoners said that 16 patterns in all were dropped. The captain believed that two types of depth charges were used. The vent valve of number 3 tank on the port side was said to have been forced open by the depth charge attacks and could not be closed again until later when U-651 again rose to periscope depth. In order to make any headway at all, with the U-boat down by the stern, it was necessary to run motors at full speed, and this used all the current in the batteries. After some time, estimated by the prisoners as about two hours, the U-boat was forced to the surface. She found herself about six miles from the British warships. She started up her diesels and moved ahead slowly, as her stern was still down and she could not get up to full buoyancy. Prisoners believed that the smoke produced by the starting up of the diesels gave away their position. British searching forces at once opened fire and proceeded to close U-651. Prisoners stated that no rounds hit U-651, the nearest having been 300 to 500 yards distant. The engineer officer and two men opened the Kingstons to hasten the end of the already sinking boat, and the crew was told to abandon ship. HMS Malcolm was then about 1,500 yards distant. U-651 sank in a position only one mile away from the spot where the SS Greyburn had been torpedoed. The Germans used a rubber raft inflated automatically by some chemical compound. They stated that they had two of these rafts, but had only time to float one of them. All the officers and men were rescued. It was stated that U-651 might have remained at sea for another three to five weeks. Prisoners professed complete ignorance as to whether they were to have returned to Germany or to a French port. They stated that prior to their departure, no arrangements whatsoever had been made for the forwarding by rail of any clothing or equipment to Lorient or Saint-Nazaire. It is probable that U-651 would have proceeded to Lorient on completion of this cruise, as she was attached to the first U-boat flotilla with U-556 and U-138. The wireless telegraph petty officer stated that it had not been possible to send a signal to their base to announce the sinking of the U-boat, as the wireless telegraph apparatus had been put out of action. He was under the impression that the British would have jammed any such signal. Most prisoners estimated the tonnage sunk by U-651 at about 16,000 tons. Section 6 details of U-651. General Remarks U-651 was a new 500-ton U-boat described as an improved type. The first of a series built by the Holwaldswerke Hamburg, she was painted gray with darker gray patches on the conning tower. She was said to have a good sea-keeping qualities on the whole but with seas five or six her bow, she was almost completely underwater. Her stability in low buoyancy condition was described as satisfactory. Prisoners stated that she rolled somewhat when surfacing with tanks fully blown. U-651 was stated to have assumed only very slight angles when surfacing or submerging. It was argued that her hulls had been strongly built, as the depth charge attacks did not fracture any welded seam. Prisoners believed that the thickness of the pressure hull was about 22 millimeters, 0.86 inches. Note, this statement should be accepted with great reserve. The internal arrangement of U-651 was described as follows. Right aft were the electric motors, then diesel engines, forward of which came the galley and the wash closet. 
The control room was approximately in the center of the U-boat, and then came the captain's cabin on the port side, faced by the wireless telegraph cabin to the starboard. Then followed the officer's quarters, the petty officer's quarters, and right forward the space for the crew. Questioned on the subject of drop keels, some prisoners stated that U-651 was not fitted with one. It is known, however, that 500-ton U-boats type 7C are fitted with a ballast keel 0.55 meters, 1.8 feet high, and 1.1 meters, or 3.61 feet broad. U-651 did not carry mines. Saddle tanks. Prisoners stated that U-651 had saddle tanks in addition to the normal external main tanks and that the former could be used for additional oil fuel. U-651 was said to have been fitted with two six-cylinder diesels, each of 1,400 horsepower manufactured by the Deutsche Werke of Cologne. The main circulator pumps of these engines were stated to have been of the reciprocating type and to have been driven by the diesels themselves. Electric Motors U-651 was said to have been fitted with electric motors manufactured by Braun Boveri of Mannheim. Batteries. Prisoners stated that during U-651's trials from the middle of February to the middle of March, the batteries were topped up only once at sea, but that on the cruise from 7th to 9th June 1941, they were not topped up at all. Each battery was said to have consisted of 60 cells. Torpedo tubes and torpedoes. Prisoners stated that U-651 had four torpedo tubes forward and none aft, and that she carried 11 torpedoes, four being in the tubes, four spares below, two above the floor plates in the forward compartment, and one in the upper deck container. There was diversity of opinion as to whether or not this last torpedo really was carried, or whether the container was empty. Prisoners stated that the container had a very solid-looking steel hatch in the rear for removing the torpedo. U-651 was said to have been armed with two guns, a 8.8 centimeter, 3.46 inch forward, and a 20 millimeter. 0.78 inch on the bridge. No gun access trunk was provided in U-651 according to her crew and both men and ammunition had to go up through the conning tower. Hydrophones. U-651 was said to have hydrophones fitted forward both to port and starboard. Detector gear. Prisoners denied that U-651 was fitted with detector gear. Radio Direction Finding It was stated that U-651 was not fitted with radio direction finding. Speeds Prisoners gave the following speeds of U-651. Utmost speed on surface, 17 to 18 knots. Cruising speed on surface, 12 to 14 knots. Half speed on surface, 4 and 1 half knots. Utmost speed submerged, 6 to 7 knots. Cruising speed submerged 2 to 5 knots. Prisoners believe that the utmost speed of about 17 knots on the surface could not have been maintained for much longer than 30 minutes, and only great danger would have justified such a risk to the engines. Prisoners said that U-651 had traveled at 12 to 14 knots when attacking on the surface, and at 2 and 1 half to 3 and 1 half knots when attacking at periscope depth. Emptying of tanks. Prisoners said that no special sub-pressure system was utilized to render the tanks, when being emptied, less vulnerable to depth charge attack. Extensible aerial. U-651 was said to have been fitted with an extensible aerial, which had, however, been short-circuited before the U-boat left keel and had not been repaired. Air-driven capstan. Prisoners stated that U-651 
had only once used her air-driven capstan on an occasion when she anchored in Keel Bay. This capstan was described as having proved completely satisfactory. Badge Prisoners stated that U-651 had been adopted by the small town of Erkelenz near Cologne, and that the U-boat bore on the conning tower the arms of that town, which consisted of a shield with a red flower surmounted by a lion. Section 7. Other U-Boats U-3 A wireless telegraph petty officer said that he had served in U-3 from about 15th March 1940 to the end of February 1941 when that U-boat was being used for training at Pilau under the command of Oberleutnant Zersi Gator, who was undergoing instruction as a prospective U-boat captain. U-9 A petty officer who had formerly served in U-9 stated that he had made two war cruises in U-9, then commanded by Oberleutnant Zersi Wolfgang Luth, the first lieutenant and the engineer officer being Oberleutnant Zersi Schonder, and Oberleutnant Engineer Wiebe. Prisoner said that he left on his first cruise in U-9 at the beginning of March 1940. He described this cruise as having been carried out in the North Sea and claimed that 12,000 tons of shipping were sunk before the U-boat returned to Wilhelmshaven about the middle of March, having been out for approximately two weeks. After two weeks in port, U-9 left at the end of March for the North Sea on her next cruise, on which 10,000 tons of shipping were sunk, according to this petty officer, and returned to Wilhelmshaven, where prisoners were transferred to the depot ship Weichel. He stated that U-9 carried out another cruise, still under the command of Luth, from which she returned to Kiel. U-18 an engine room petty officer stated that early in March 1941 he joined U-18, then in service as a training boat under Captain Lieutenant Folgosang, the engineer officer being Oberleutnant Engineer Harald Wachner, who subsequently served in U-138 and was made a prisoner when that U-boat was sunk. U-19 A petty officer claimed to have made two cruises in U-19 at the beginning of the war under Captain Lieutenant Müller, who had succeeded Captain Lieutenant Meckel. These cruises must have been carried out in September or October 1939, as it is known that Captain Lieutenant Joachim Schepke was then appointed to U-19 and carried out a number of cruises before leaving her in April 1940. U-19 is believed to have been sunk in May or June 1940. See Confidential Book 4051-19, page 14. U-20 A prisoner formerly in U-20 stated that in June and July 1940 this U-boat was being used for training. The captain being Oberleutnant C. Ottokar Paulsen. U-30 under the third war cruise of U-30, it was stated in an NID note in Charlie Baker 4051-23, page 22, that the attack by HMS Vesper was the only one which could refer to an attack on U-30 on 9th January 1940. In point of fact, HMS Scarborough made a contact which she classified as submarine on the date in question in a position to the southwest of Eddystone. She delivered nine attacks, dropping more than 20 depth charges, and was then joined by HMS ships Kelvin, Windsor, and Acasts, who carried out depth charge attacks throughout the day. It seems more likely that the attacks southwest of Eddystone were those referred to by prisoners and mentioned in their notebooks, as the times agree closely with those given by the Germans, who also recorded that the attacks were carried out by a whole crowd of hunting craft. 
U-43. A prisoner said that he had served in U-43 from May 1939 until late summer of 1940, and that during this period the captain was Captain Lieutenant Wilhelm Ambrisius. Prisoner claimed to have made five or six war cruises in U-43, during which time 60,000 to 70,000 tons of shipping were sunk. The first cruise was said to have been of six weeks duration and to have been carried out in November and December 1939. During this period, U-43 was based on Wilhelmshaven, but the last of these cruises ended at Lorient at the end of August or early September 1940, when Prisoner left the U-boat. He denied that U-43 had ever sunk any warships or laid mines. U-46 A petty officer said that he had served in U-46 from the early summer of 1939 until a date at the beginning of July 1940. He claimed to have been on five war cruises in U-46, the first four having been under Captain Lieutenant Herbert Soler with Oberleutnant Zersi Erich Top as first lieutenant, Captain Lieutenant Engineer Herbert Burkhardt as engineer officer and a junior officer. Prisoner added that these four cruises were not very successful. Sinkings quoted were first cruise, nothing, second cruise, 20,000 tons, third cruise, 15,000 tons, and fourth cruise, nothing. According to statements, not more than 10,000 tons were sunk on any one of these undertakings. It is known that Soller was relieved by Oberleutnant Zersi Engelbert Endras, formerly first lieutenant of U-47 under Captain Lieutenant Gunther Prien, during the second half of June 1940. Prisoner claimed that on U-46 fifth war cruise, 54,000 tons of shipping, including an auxiliary cruiser, were sunk. This cruise seems to have been carried out in late June and early July 1940, as the German High Command communique of 6 July 1940 announced that Endras had sunk 54,800 tons of shipping, including the AMC Carinthia. NID note, HMS Carinthia, 20,000... 277 tons was sunk at 1421 on 6 June 1940 in position 55 degrees by 13 north and 12 degrees by 40 west. U-46 6th war cruise seems to have been carried out in August and early September 1940 as the German High Command stated on 4th September 1940 that Endras had sunk another auxiliary cruiser HMS Dunvegan Castle he was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross on 9th September 1940, and the German press claimed that on his two cruises he had achieved a total of 106,307 tons. This implies that the sinkings for U-46 6 cruise amounted to 50,507 tons. NID note, HMS Dunvegan Castle 15,007 tons was sunk at 2307 on 27th August 1940 in position 54 degrees by 50 north and 11 degrees by 42 west. She was hit by two torpedoes. The next cruise of U-46 appears to have been carried out in October 1940, having possibly begun in September as on 20th October 1940, the German High Command announced that Endras had increased his total sinkings for that cruise to 44,000 tons by his participation in the sinking of 17 ships totaling 110,000 tons on the night of 19th October 1940, on which occasion Prien had sunk 8 ships. NID note, 12 ships only were sunk with the loss of a total tonnage of 75,069 tons. Subsequent activities of U-46 are mentioned in Charlie Baker 405120, page 17, and in Charlie Baker 405123, page 26. More recent mention of Endras was made on 9th June 1941, when the German radio broadcast that this officer had sunk 
214,200 tons of shipping up to date. On 11th June 1941, he was awarded the Oak Leaves of the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross as the 14th officer of the German Armed Forces to receive that decoration. On 15th June 1941, Endras was promoted Captain Leutnant for his special services. The name of the junior officer of U-46 was given as Oberleutnant C. Helwig. The latter officer of the 1935 term is known to have been in the German Air Force in 1927 and must have been re-transferred to the Navy. Owing to the shortage of U-boat commanders, several young naval officers, formerly in the German Air Force, have returned to the Navy and been given commands of U-boats after a short cruise of training. At present, there are 16 officers known to have been thus transferred. U-48 Prisoners stated that U-48 Captain Leutnant Herbert Schulze had on one occasion picked up 120 survivors from a ship and had brought them safely to port. A German broadcast on 2nd June 1941 claimed that Schulze had sunk 11 ships totaling 52,600 tons during the previous week. A further broadcast on 12th June 1941 by the Deutschlandsender stated that Schulze was the sixth U-boat captain to have sunk over 200,000 tons of shipping. On 13th June 1941, the German High Command announced that the oak leaves to the Knight's insignia of the Iron Cross had been awarded to Schulze as the 15th officer of the German Armed Forces to receive this decoration. On 5th July 1941, the Deutschlandsender broadcast a commentary on the return of Schulze's U-boat, described as having sunk over 400,000 tons of shipping while under the command of three captains in succession, and now once more under Schulze. This officer stated that on his latest cruise, he had sunk 60,000 tons of shipping, including three large tankers outward bound from Great Britain in ballast. Schulze is now Flotillenschiff, a commanding officer of the third U-boat flotilla. U-67. Prisoners stated that U-67, Captain Leutnant Heinrich Bleichroth, left Kiel in company with U-556 on the morning of 1st May 1941 and proceeded through the Kiel Canal, after which she went to Wilhelmshaven to a dockyard. On 21st June 1941, the German radio claimed that Bleichroth had increased his sinkings for his current cruise to 53,000 tons. U-69 A German broadcast on 27th June 1941 claimed that Captain Leutnant Metzler's U-boat had sunk five merchant ships totaling 31,500 tons off the coast of West Africa. It is known that this commander commands U-69. On 2nd August 1941, the Deutschlandsender broadcast a commentary on the return of Metzler's U-boat and asserted that this U-boat had sunk 11 armed merchant ships with an aggregate of 76,170 tons, of which about 40,000 tons were attributed to the last cruise. The one victim sunk by gunfire was described as a heavily armed ship sunk one night after a gunnery duel and suspected of having been an auxiliary cruiser. Metzler was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross. U-74 Prisoners stated that U-74, Captain Leutnant Kentrat, was near the battleship Bismarck on the night before she was sunk. They added that U-74 had been damaged and could not submerge, and that she had three torpedoes left. U-556 spoke to her, then submerged, leaving U-74 to her own devices. U-74 was stated to have picked up three survivors from Bismarck and to have returned to a French port with them. According to prisoners, these three men were met by the naval authorities who immediately administered to them a special oath of secrecy and sent them at once to Berlin for interrogation. U-93 
A petty officer said that he was drafted to stand by U-93 in May 1940 when she was in the final stages of construction. He added that she was a 500-ton U-boat commanded by Captain Lieutenant Klaus Korth. The engineer officer was said to have been promoted from the lower deck. On 16th June 1941, the Deutschland Sender broadcast the return to port of Korth's U-boat and Korth's total sinking were announced as 80,000 tons. He was awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross. U-98 On 10th June, the Deutschland Sender stated that the U-boat commanded by Captain Lieutenant Goethe had sunk one fat victim on her first cruise. This was said to be a ship of about 20,000 tons. The broadcast added that Gusset's second cruise resulted in the sinking of more than 35,000 tons of shipping. U-103 On 13th July 1941, the German radio claimed that Corvette Captain Victor Schütze had sunk up to that date 37 ships totaling over 200,000 tons and was thus the seventh U-boat captain to destroy more than 200,000 tons. On 15th July 1941, Schütze received the oak leaves to the knight insignia of the Iron Cross as the 23rd officer of the German armed forces to wear this decoration. On 30th July 1941, the Deutschland Sender broadcast an interview with Schütze in which he claimed that his victims included ships carrying war material to the Near East via the Cape of Good Hope. U-105 The German High Command communique of 17th May 1941 stated that Captain Lieutenant Georg Sheva had reported the sinking of five merchant ships totaling 33,000 tons. On 25th May, 1941, this officer was awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross. It was claimed that he had so far sunk 14 armed merchant ships, mounting to 96,112 tons, and had carried out some special operations. It is known that Sheva was in Lorient on 19th June 1941. U-106 Prisoners stated that U-106 Captain Lieutenant Jürgen Usten was at Lorient when U-556 was there and that she was still there in 19th June 1941. U-107 Prisoners said that U-107 Captain Lieutenant Hessler had a laughing cat painted on the conning tower as her badge. On 30th June 1941, the German radio announced that Hessler had been awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross, having sunk in all 18 armed merchant ships, totaling 111,272 tons, of which 14, representing 90,272 tons, were sunk within a period of almost three and a half months. Other German reports added that many victims were sunk very far to the south, and a long way from home. U-108 An engine room petty officer stated that he was drafted in July 1940 to stand by U-108, a 750-ton U-boat, then in the final stages of construction at the Deichemag Yard, Bremen. The captain was confirmed as being Captain Lieutenant Schulz. The junior officer was Lieutenant Zersi Fenn. U-108 appears to have taken an unusually long time to complete if prisoners' statements are accurate. As he said that U-108 carried out trials in the Baltic at the same time as U-110, which was during December 1940 and January and February 1941. But U-108 appears to have completed her trials before U-110, as she was said to have sunk two ships amounting to 12,000 tons, and to have arrived in Lorient in March 1941. Schultz broadcast a brief account of his cruise on 9th May 1941. See Charlie Baker, 4051-23.
the petty officer mentioned above added that U-108 left Lorient on her second cruise early in April 1941, he claimed that this U-boat sank an auxiliary cruiser estimated at 12,000 to 15,000 tons, having fired four torpedoes at her, two of which hit. This action was said to have taken place early one morning, the U-boat firing from periscope depth. U-108 was said to have returned from this cruise early in May 1941. Schultz did not mention this cruise in his broadcast on 9th May 1941. On 6th July 1941, the Deutschland Sender announced that Schultz's U-boat had been particularly successful in North Atlantic operations. Prisoners described U-108 as being exactly the same in every detail as U-110. See Charlie Baker 401523. But he said that U-108 had originally four containers on the upper deck for the stowage of four spare torpedoes, whereas survivors of U-110 stated that their U-boat had originally had eight or ten of these containers. As in the case of U-110, these containers were removed from U-108 as the captain considered the transfer of torpedoes to the interior of the U-boat too difficult in the Atlantic. U-108 was said to have had two MAN diesels developing 1,800 horsepower each. Prisoners stated that she had the coat of arms of a German city painted on her conning tower as her badge. U-120 Prisoners described U-120 as a 250-ton or 300-ton U-boat built at Lübeck and commissioned in March or April 1941. She was said to have no saddle tanks, but this statement was not confirmed, and three torpedo tubes. Prisoners believed that she had not carried out any active service cruises. U-121 One man stated that he had been drafted to stand by U-121, a sister boat of U-120, when she was in the final stage of construction at Lübeck in December 1940. He added that she was commissioned in April 1941, a few days later than U-120. The captain was said to be Oberleutnant Sir C. Schröder, of the several officers of this name in the German Navy. The most likely one to be in command of U-121 is Oberleutnant Sir C. Siegfried Schröder. The engineer officer's name was given as Leutnant Engineer Gabler. Prisoner said that he remained in this U-boat until December 1940, and that until then she was in service at Pilau, as a training U-boat. He had not heard of her carrying out any active service cruises. U-139 Prisoners stated that U-139, a sister ship of U-137 and U-138, 300 tons, was commissioned on 5th July 1940. U-144 An engine room petty officer stated that he had been on board U-144 when he was undergoing a petty officer's course at Gottenhafen in January and February 1940. He implied that U-144 was then being used for training. Some details of this U-boat, believed to be a 300-ton type, were given in Charlie Bravo 405121, page 16. Prisoner gave the captain's name as Captain Lieutenant von Mittelstedt. This officer formerly served in the cruiser Admiral Scheer and is believed to be a newcomer to U-boats. He has the reputation of drinking too much. U-203 The Deutschland Sender announced on 30th July 1941 that the U-boats commanded by Captain Lieutenant Rolf Mutzelberg, Captain Lieutenant Bauer, Oberleutnant Zerzi, Schuler, had particularly distinguished themselves in the Battle of the Atlantic. It is known that Mutzelberg commands U-203. In a broadcast interview on 4th August, Mutzelberg said that he had just returned to his base on the Atlantic, having sunk 
31,000 tons of merchant shipping and a British destroyer on his second cruise. He added that he had used up all his torpedoes and nearly all his fuel oil. He described an attack on a convoy by his U-boat together with a number of other U-boats in which he claimed to have sunk an 8,000 ton and a 6,000 ton ship after which he was depth charged but was soon able to surface again and renew the attack on what was only a fraction of a convoy then. U-552 Mention was made earlier in this report of U-552, Oberleutnant der See Erich Taupe, which met U-556 on 23rd or 24th June 1941 on the latter's last cruise. A wireless telegraph petty officer of U-556 stated that U-552 was near U-556 until the latter was sunk and he intercepted signals from her. U-552 is believed to have a red devil painted on the conning tower as her badge. Top was awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross according to a German broadcast of 4th July 1941 which added that the news of this decoration had reached Top while he was operating in the North Atlantic. The broadcast also stated that Top had sunk 108,970 tons of shipping by mid-June 1941. On 1st August 1941 the Sender announced that Top had now returned from his latest cruise on which he had sunk 25,300 tons. It was claimed that this officer's greatest achievement had been the sinking of 16 ships totaling 25,300 tons, a feat said to have been performed off the coast of Great Britain while Top was in command of a small U-boat with a red devil painted on the conning tower. After surviving a number of heavy attacks, the small U-boat returned to her base. U-555 Prisoners said that U-555 was commissioned before U-556, that is to say, before 6th February. U-555 appears to have been of the series of U-551 to U-562, building at the Blom and Voss yard at Hamburg. U-562 and U-574 As mentioned earlier in this report, prisoners admitted that U-562, Oberleutnant zur See Kohlmann, and U-574, Oberleutnant zur See Reinhard Zuren, took part in the attack on convoy HX-133 on the night of 26th, 27th June, 1941. Section 8. U-Boat Construction Hamburg Prisoners from U-556 claimed to have seen two other 500-ton U-boats already in the water and nearing completion early in February 1941 at the Blom and Voss yards when U-556 was commissioned. These works were described as being among the busiest building yards and as producing a steady stream of new U-boats. It is believed that a series U-551 to U-562 now completed and a further series of U-563 to U-574 were under construction here. An officer prisoner claimed to have been told by a dockyard engineer that British air raids had caused considerable damage at this yard, the administrative offices having received several direct hits, and at least one U-boat on the stocks was also hit. The Holwald yard was said to have had six to eight 500 ton U-boats under construction when the crew of U-651 was standing by their U-boat during the later stages of building in November and December 1940. They stated that U-651 was the first of a series, but they did not know of how many it consisted. Prisoners believed that the Stulkenyard had recently started building U-boats. Kiel Prisoners from U-138 stated that only two other U-boats were on the slips at the Kriegsmarine Werft when their U-boat was under construction. 
They deny that serious damage was done to U-boat construction by British air raids and claimed that two days sufficed to get the Germania yard in full working order after the worst raid. Danzig. It was stated that a series of U-boats with identity numbers in the 400s was being built at Danzig, a series probably commencing with U-401. This building yard was described as the least efficient of the building yards owing to the lack of experienced workmen. Very few U-boats were being built there, according to prisoners, who estimated the number as four. Stettin. It was stated that Stettin only started to produce U-boats in July 1940. Elbing. Prisoners believed that a yard at Elbing had recently started to build U-boats. People's Car Factories A petty officer said that the factories erected for the mass manufacture of the cheap People's Car had been turned over to the production of U-boat parts. He added that, in addition, these factories were also occupied in aircraft production. General Remarks Prisoners expressed disappointment at what they called the delay in the production of U-boats in adequate numbers. They said that Hitler's announcement of a U-boat offensive for the spring of 1941 was premature and that a sufficient number of the new U-boats would only become available during the summer or autumn of 1941. U-boat series. From information obtained from prisoners of war, the following table of the types and series of U-boats constructed up to the end of the series U-103 to U-111 is considered to be accurate. U-boat series, type, tonnage, number of torpedo tubes, building yard. U-1 to U-6, type 2A, 250 tons, three torpedo tubes, built at Deutsche Werke, Kiel. U-7 to U-24, type 2B, 250 ton, three torpedo tubes, Germania Yard, Kiel. U-25 to U-26, type 1, 712 tons, six torpedo tubes, Deschemak Yard, Bremen. U-27 to U-32, type 7, 500 ton, five torpedo tubes, Deschemak Yard, Bremen. U-33 to U-36, type 7, 500 ton, five torpedo tubes, Germania Yard, Kiel. U-37 to U-44, type 9, 700 tons, six torpedo tubes, Deschemak Yard, Bremen. U-45 to U-55, type 7B, 500 tons, five torpedo tubes, Germania Yard, Kiel. U-56 to U-63, type 2C, 250 tons, three torpedo tubes, Deutsche Werke, Kiel. U-64 to U-68, type 9A, 740 tons, six torpedo tubes, Deschemek Yard, Bremen. U-69 to U-72, type 7B, 500 tons, five torpedo tubes, Germania Yard, Kiel. U-73 to U-80, type 7B, 500 tons, five torpedo tubes, Wolken, Vergesack, Bremen. U-81 to U-82, type 7C, 500 tons, 5 torpedo tubes, Volken, Vegasak, Bremen. U-83 to U-87, type 7B, 500 tons, 5 torpedo tubes, not known where built. U-88 to U-102, type 7C, 500 tons, 5 torpedo tubes, Germania, Yard, Kiel. U-103 to U-111, type 9A, 740 tons, 6 torpedo tubes, Deschemek Yard, Bremen. Information regarding higher numbered series of U-boats is not so reliable, but is believed to be as follows. U-112 to U-121, unknown type and tonnage or torpedo tubes, built Flendewerke Yard, Lübeck. U-122 to U-130, Type 9B, 740 tons, 6 torpedo tubes, Deschemek Yard, Bremen. 
U131 to U136, unknown type, 500 ton, 5 torpedo tubes, Volkin, Vegasak, Bremen, U137 to U140, type 2D, 300 tons, 3 torpedo tubes, Deutsche Werk, Kiel, U141 to U150, unknown, 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 U151 to all unknown, U201 to unknown, 500 tons, 5 torpedo tubes, Germania, Yard, Kiel, U281, Flendewerk, Yard, Lübeck, U331, built Nordsewerk, Emden, U371, 300 tons, 3 torpedo tubes, Kriegsmarine Werft, Kiel, U401, Danzig, U451, built Kriegsmarine Werft, Kiel, U551 to U562, Unknown type, 500 ton, 5 torpedo tubes, Blom and Boss, Hamburg. U563 to U574, type 7C, 500 tons, 5 torpedo tubes, Blom and Voss Yard, Hamburg. U651 to unknown, type unknown, 500 ton, 5 torpedo tubes, Holwatz Yard, Hamburg. U701 to unknown, type 9A, 740 ton, 6 torpedo tubes, Stuckenyard, Hamburg, U751, to unknown, built Wilhelmshaven, UD1, to unknown, Rotterdam, Holland. Section 9, U-Boat Losses, U22, the captain of U138, believed that U-22, Oberleutnant zur See Karl-Heinz Jänisch, was lost in June 1940 and not in April 1940, as stated by prisoners captured at an earlier date. See Charlie Baker 405120, page 21. He added that U-22 was sunk near Scapa Flow. U-50 it was again stated that U-50 had been lost some time ago. See Charlie Baker 405121. U-59. Prisoners captured at an earlier date thought that U-59 had been lost. These rumors were repeated, but no definite confirmation was obtained. U-65. U-65 is a 740-ton boat laid down in December 1938 and completed probably early in 1940. She took part in the Norwegian operation in April 1940. She was formerly under the command of Captain Leutnant Hans Gerrit von Stockhausen, who was relieved by Oberleutnant zur See Joachim Hoppe early in 1941. According to an intercepted letter from Kiel to a prisoner of war in Canada, Hoppe seems to have been lost in U-65, towards the end of April or early in May 1941. At Whitsuntide, 1st June 1941, he was stated to have been missing for six weeks or longer, but his loss had not yet been officially communicated to his next of kin. Section 10. Technical Information An engineer officer prisoner stated that the most popular engines used in U-boats were MAN four-cycle diesels, and that they were usually, but not always, supercharged. He added that Buki exhaust gas blowers were fitted. This officer said that it was planned to remove the engines bodily during a major refit, but it was also stated that the hatch through which the engines were passed into and out of the U-boat was only to be opened once every two years, as this hatch was not only closed by riveting, but also by welding. Prisoners denied that the Germans had experienced trouble with the main bearing mountings, which he described as never needing attention once they had been sufficiently tightened. He said that Sulze and other two-cycle engines were not employed in U-boats. 
This officer had a high opinion of the Junkers free piston compressor. Periscope. An officer prisoner who claimed to have made a lengthy inspection of HMS SEAL described the German periscope as being superior to the British type both in quality and as regards mechanism. He said that the German lenses were marvelous achievements and were contained in a casing slightly smaller than an ordinary matchbox. He also stated that the most striking feature of the German periscope was its automatic concealment action, by which he means the upper part of the periscope was automatically lowered or raised as the level of the sea varied, so that it would not be suddenly revealed in the trough of a wave. This device, although described as automatic, was said to be controlled to some extent by a petty officer. A most important point was the fact that the lower part of the periscope remained in position and the movement of the upper part did not in any way affect the officer using the periscope. Upper Deck Prisoners stated that U-boats having torpedo containers above the pressure hull had no wooden covering on the upper deck. They said that in cases when these torpedo containers had been removed, the spaces formed, and in fact the whole upper deck with the exception of a small area at the bow and another at the stern, was covered with wooden slats, about 20 centimeters to 3 to 4 centimeters thick, spaces of about 1 centimeter being left between the boards. The air bottles and floats carried on top of the pressure hull were said to be protected by metal coverings which protruded above the level of the upper deck. It was stated that in addition to the above, Pipelines for oil, air, and water were fitted in the space between the pressure hull and the upper deck, and that all ropes, fenders, capstan head, and capstan bars were kept there. According to an unconfirmed statement, a wooden dinghy was also carried there. The space was estimated by prisoners to be about 60 centimeters deep in the 750-ton type U-boat. Torpedoes Prisoners stated that the upper deck containers for spare torpedoes were pressure tight to the same extent as the U-boat's hull, and that they were hinged at one end so that the other end could be raised in order that the torpedo could slide through a hatch down rails into the interior of the hull. See Charlie Baker 405118, page 12. It was added that only air torpedoes could be carried in these containers, and were stowed without their warheads and with the air vessels empty. One prisoner described a torpedo used by the Germans as having some kind of small explosive charge fitted in the pistol or just forward of the warhead. This charge was said to blow a hole in the plating of the ship attacked, through which the torpedo entered the ship. The warhead then detonated inside the ship by means of a delay fuse consisting of a powder train set off by the first explosion. The time between the two explosions was given as five seconds. Prisoners all agreed that magnetic pistols were no longer used, as these had proved unsatisfactory from several points of view, especially when exploded prematurely. It was stated that the after part of the body of each torpedo was marked with green paint to indicate that the torpedo had been tested and found ready to use. Prisoners said that the Germans had no means of aiming torpedoes other than on the surface or from periscope depth. Degaussing detector. An officer prisoner stated that the Germans had a device which indicated the presence of a degaussed ship. This detector was said to function by virtue of the electric action of the demagnetizing field of electricity. Underwater telephony. Although most prisoners had not personal experience of underwater telephony, they insisted that successful experiments had been carried out by the Germans. One telegraphist claimed to have taken part in some of these experiments off Heligoland and added that the Germans were able to communicate by this method as far as the horizon. Other prisoners believed that the range of the German underwater telephones was considerably greater. The telegraphist mentioned above stated that underwater telephony 
would be used to communicate with other U-boats only in cases of emergency, as it would be easy for the enemy to locate the transmitting U-boat. Telephones without batteries. Officer prisoners said that new telephones for internal communication had been installed in U-boats. These instruments did not require batteries and had a voltage of 220, and loudspeakers were fitted for the transmission of orders. Prisoners expressed great satisfaction with these new instruments. Escape Apparatus It was claimed that men wearing the German escape apparatus could remain submerged for about half an hour and ascend from a depth of 70 meters, or 229 feet. This apparatus is in the form of a life belt and contains a small bottle of oxygen under a pressure of 50 atmospheres, which inflates the apparatus when the wearer comes to the surface. A nose clip and a rubber mouthpiece on which the teeth can be clenched prevent water entering the lungs, and the wearer then breathes in the ordinary way, the air being purified by a potash cartridge. But care must be taken that water does not enter the apparatus, as this would act on the potassium cartridge and form a poisonous gas which, if breathed, would cause injury to the lungs. Several men had lost their lives in this way. Prisoners added that it was necessary to ascend very slowly when coming up from any considerable depth, as a rapid ascent would injure the lungs and prove fatal. Section 11. U-Boat Bases Kiel. Prisoners admitted that air raids in the earlier part of the summer of 1941 had caused considerable damage to Kiel, but mainly to dwelling houses. It was stated, however, that an electricity power station, the gas works, and the water works were also hit, and that this caused considerable dislocation. The Tirpitzkwe, where U-boats were lying, was also hit at one end, but the U-boats were quickly removed to safety. Two ships, the Krefeld and the Berlin, were said to have been attacked by torpedo-carrying aircraft, but were later set on fire by incendiary bombs. The guards for the U-boats and a number of SS men were on board Berlin at the time. A disused oil pipeline near the quay caught fire, and the remaining oil spread out flaming across the surface of the water and started a fire on the outer hall of Berlin. But the fires were got under control. Prisoners stated that work was proceeding on reinforced concrete shelters as early as April last year. They assumed that these shelters would have been completed some time ago. It was stated that there was a homing beacon to assist U-boats making for Kiel. Hamburg. The Blom and Voss yards were said to have been hit several times during British air raids early in April 1941 and serious fires caused. Prisoners stated that early in May 1941 serious damage was caused by British air raids. An oil tanker in the harbor was set on fire and two small ships were sunk according to prisoners who added with pleasure the information that some warehouses belonging to British and American firms had also been burnt out. Considerable damage was said to have been done at many points to dwelling houses and public buildings. Gotenhafen Prisoners stated that the Deutsche Werke had taken over all the Polish shipbuilding yards, including the ships under construction, and that these works were being greatly enlarged. A number of large ships were said to be lying at Gottenhafen, manned by skeleton crews. Ships took it in turns to provide meals for the crews of all the ships, in order to avoid the necessity of maintaining complete catering arrangements all the time in every ship. In addition to the U-boat training establishments, the Coastal Artillery School and the Anti-Aircraft School were said to be at Gottenhafen. Lorient Most prisoners stated that concrete U-boat shelters were being constructed at Lorient and said that these consisted of a row of eight arched reinforced concrete shelters built side by side, each taking a U-boat, with a very thick concrete roof covering the whole row. The thickness of this concrete roof was given 
as about 3 meters, 9.8 feet thick. But this statement was not confirmed. Each individual shelter was described as being large enough to allow of repairs being carried out to the U-boat inside. It was claimed that tests had been carried out and these shelters could withstand a direct hit of the heaviest type of bomb. There was considerable diversity of opinion as to the location of these shelters, as some shelters were said to be dummies, and prisoners were not sure which were intended to be the actual shelters and which were the dummies. Most prisoners believed that the main shelters had been built in the fishing harbor at Keroman, but others stated that they had seen one finished and one incomplete shelter on the town side of the river Skorfe, between the former arsenal, now U-boat barracks, and the Pont de Candra. The captain of U-556 stated that by the middle of June 1941, shelters for about 10 U-boats had been completed. Officer prisoners, who also were last in Lorient, in the middle of June 1941, stated that up to that date, neither the dummy nor the real U-boat shelters had been hit during British air raids. The torpedo store was said to be on the bank of the Scorfe River, opposite the town, in a position just above the Pointe de Caudron, but prisoners added that U-boats seldom embarked torpedoes there, as the usual practice was to take torpedoes in lighters to the U-boats. More exact location of some buildings used as quarters for U-boat personnel was obtained. Hans Mathis and Hans Luf, see Charlie Baker 4051-23, page 31, were described as being large yellow houses opposite each other on either side of the street leading from the Port de Borbehan to the barracks. See Plan of Lorient in Charlie Baker, 4051-15. Prisoners stated that in December 1940, a patrol of 10 heavily armed Germans disappeared without trace, and in retaliation, the German authorities shot a large number of Lorient inhabitants. The municipal authorities had to furnish lists of all males from the age of 19 upwards, and for every German raiding killed, the Germans shot 10 Frenchmen, while 25 Frenchmen were shot for every German officer killed. Prisoners agreed that there were very few men left in Lorient. At that time, the Germans were not allowed to venture out in groups of less than four men, and had to be armed. But the attitude of the French towards the Germans in Lorient was said to have greatly improved, and the murder of Germans in the streets at night had become a rare occurrence. Several prisoners stated that they had fraternized with the local inhabitants and had formed friendships with the women folk, whom they frequently took to the cinema. The Germans affected an attitude of pity towards the French, whom they described as harmless and hungry. Nevertheless, some officer and chief petty officer prisoners suspected a hidden, subtle, and organized opposition on the part of the French, which they feared as likely to become dangerous. It was noted by the Germans that in spite of the polite and obliging attitude of the French officials and workmen, something important always went wrong with the German arrangements in which any reliance had been placed on French cooperation. Several prisoners deplored the tendencies, noted among U-boat officers and men, of being too friendly and indiscreet towards the French in the local cafes and brothels. The leakage of information was said to have become notorious, and it was alleged that the prostitutes of Lorient knew more about the past and present plans than many German officers. The sinking of U-138 and her failure to carry out her special task were attributed by some prisoners to this serious leakage. Brest Prisoners stated that U-boat shelters were being constructed in Brest during the spring and summer of 1941. An officer prisoner described having seen these shelters in the early stages of construction, and expressed surprise that the British had never attempted to bomb these, but has always attacked the big ships only. 
Early in June, according to an officer prisoner, three shelters were nearly finished and it was proposed to build a further nine. Prisoners believed that Germans had an ambitious program which included 12 large dry docks and 10 floating docks. An officer prisoner expressed great concern at what he termed the amazing cooperation of the French with the British for purposes of sabotage. He cited various failures on the part of the French to assist German operations and expressed his suspicion of certain coincidences such as the fact that the dock gates should fail to open at the moment when the battlecruiser Gneisenau was due to enter. Karnak The Grand Hotel de la Mer has been taken over by the German naval authorities as a rest home for U-boat personnel to spend their leave between cruises. The usual period spent there by U-boat crews seems to be one week. The hotel was described as a sandstone building on the seafront. Section 12. Depot Ships. Praetoria. Prisoners stated that over 1,000 naval personnel were living on board the depot ship at Pilau. This ship was the former liner Praetoria. Sar. The Sar was known to be a U-boat depot ship, but prisoners stated that she had latterly been used to escort convoys proceeding to Denmark and Norway. Nordland. Some prisoners said that while at Memo, they lived on board Nordland. Iberia. The crew of U-651 lived on board Iberia when they were in Danzig in February 1941. St. Louis. This vessel was said to have been a depot ship at Kiel during the spring of 1941. Hein Godenwind. Crews drafted to stand by new U-boats under construction at Hamburg were said to receive theoretical instruction on board Hein Godenwind. These men lived in the barracks at Steinwerder, according to prisoners. Section 13 Staff of U-Boat Organization in Kiel The U-Boat Organization Department under Vice Admiral Commanding U-Boats is at Kiel. It consists of the following. Head of Department Kapitän Zersi von Friedeberg Adjutant Leutnant Zersi Heinschen Departmental Office Captain Leutnant Jeppner Haldenhoff who deals with personnel appointments of officers, officers' courses, etc. Captain Lieutenant Müller Arknecke, who deals with all matters relating to petty officers and men in every category. Lieutenant Zersi Otto Dama, who deals with the appointment and promotion of midshipmen. Lieutenant Zersi de Reserve Plocke, who deals with officers' papers. Captain Lieutenant der Reserve Schacke, who deals with aircraft and transport of aircraft, welfare of prisoners of war, and their dependents. Section 14 U Boat Training Pilau. The first U Boat Training Division, known as 1 ULD, Erst U Bootsleer Division, is known to be at Pilau. This training division consists of a navigational section and a technical section. Corvette Capitaine Ibeken is known to be in command of the former, while Corvette Capitaine Engineer Zepka was stated to be the commanding officer of the latter. Other officers on the staff of the establishment were said to be Corvette Capitaine Paul Buchel, known to have commanded U-32, earlier in the war, and Corvette Capitaine von Schmidt, known to have been in command of U-37 at the beginning of the war, but to have proved unsatisfactory. Men undergoing instruction were accommodated in the depot ships Robert Ley and Praetoria, 1,500 to 2,000 in the former and over 1,000 men in the latter ship, according to prisoners. Officers and officials were also said to live on board. 
it was added that theoretical instruction was given in the dining saloons of Pretoria, which had formerly been a liner, and also in old barracks, which were situated about a quarter of an hour's walk from Pilau railway station in the direction of Königsberg, on the left of the railway line. Prisoners stated that in the spring of 1941, about 30 training U-boats were in service in the harbor of Pilau. These formed the U-boat training flotilla. U-boats Ausbildungsflotilla. Gotenhafen. The second U-boat training division, 2 ULD, is known to be at Gotenhafen. The commanding officer was said to be Corvette Captain Sobi, while Corvette Captain Werner Hartmann, who replaced von Schmidt in U-37 and achieved considerable success, was the recruiting officer. Corvette Captain Wilhelm Rollmann, also a well-known U-boat ace and formerly in command of U-34, was also said to be on staff of the establishment. The depot ships at Gottenhafen were said to be Wilhelm Gustav, Kap Arkana, and Hansa, capable of accommodating a total of about 3,000 men. Also at Gottenhafen, according to prisoners, is the U-Boat Acceptance Committee, known as the UAK, U-Boats Abname Commission, described as consisting of U-Boat captains of the last war who are responsible for deciding whether new U-Boat trials have proved satisfactory and when these ships are available for active service. The U-Boat Tactical Training Flotilla, U-Boats Taktische Frontausbildungsflotilla, is known to be at Gottenhafen, New U-boats working up are temporarily attached to this flotilla and carry out tactical exercises as much under active service conditions as possible. Another establishment at Gottenhafen was stated to be the anti-submarine school, U-Boats Abwehr Schule. Section 15. Naval Establishments in Occupied Territory Le Havre. Prisoners stated that the first mine sweeping flotilla was based in Le Havre. Der Schelling. Some prisoners stated that they were in a party of some 200 recruits of the 10th Manning Division who were sent in June 1940 via Harlingen to Der Schelling. They were billeted on Dutch families on the island and received elementary training. They added that the only other troops there were coastal defense troops and men of the anti-aircraft batteries. Poliak. From Terschelling, about five to sixty men were transferred to Poliak, near the mouth of the Gironde in August 1940, according to prisoners, and their training was continued under the supervision of a chief petty officer who was in charge of the whole establishment. Prisoners said that they were accommodated in a deserted country mansion during this period. Den Helder Prisoners stated that the 31st minesweeping flotilla was based on Den Helder. Section 16 U-Boat Tactics Remarks on Attacking Convoys Prisoners stated that a U-boat could fire four torpedoes more or less simultaneously, and that it was possible to deduce from the resultant explosions as to whether the targets had been hit. If destroyers were seen through the periscope to be approaching, the U-boat would dive deeply, switch off everything if it was thought that she might escape being located. The Germans believed that the British practice was for the hunting vessels to stop and try to locate the U-boat by means of listening gear, and then to attack with depth charges. Prisoners added that the British usually attacked at intervals for about five hours, and then gave up the hunt. They added that the U-boat would then follow the convoy, but proceeding at first on an opening course in order to reload her tubes away from the likelihood of an attack. This sequence of events might be repeated several times over a period of two or three days, according to the prisoners. Prisoners said that on receipt of a report by aircraft or U-boat of a convoy, 
the Admiral U-boats would signal the information to all U-boats operating in the area near which the convoy might be expected to pass. The possibility was not excluded of a U-boat captain passing any information about a convoy to such U-boats as he knew to be in the vicinity. Prisoners thought that U-boats within a radius of 200 miles might be warned and kept informed by the Admiral U-boats or directly by the U-boat maintaining contact. Fulangschalter, of the size, speed, course, and escorts of the convoy. When a convoy had been reported, it was the practice of U-boat captains to delay their attack until they thought that other U-boats expected were also ready to attack, according to prisoners. It was stated that a U-boat captain would not always fire at the first ship, which came within range of his torpedo tubes, but would try to pick out the biggest target and might fire two or more torpedoes in rapid succession. The rarity of U-boat attack on destroyers was explained by the statement that four torpedoes would probably be necessary before a hit was obtained, and in any case the position of the U-boat would be betrayed. Prisoners admitted that the zigzagging of ships makes it more difficult for U-boats to hit them. Attack on ships proceeding independently the chief quartermaster of U-556 stated that usually two torpedoes would be fired simultaneously at a fast ship proceeding independently. Attacks by gunfire Prisoners stated that U-boat men hated to attack ships by gunfire as they thought a U-boat on the surface to be an expected target and extremely vulnerable. They considered that attacks by gunfire should be limited to the following actions. A. When attacking unarmed merchant vessels. B. When the ship attacked is of such shallow draft that it offers only a small target area for a torpedo. Prisoners said that corvettes were difficult to attack by torpedo because of their shallow draft. C. For mopping up purposes after preliminary torpedo attack. Evasion Tactics an officer prisoner who professed to have considerable knowledge of German submarine detecting devices compared the sound of British ASDIC transmissions striking a U-boat to the ticking of a large clock. He added that this noise appeared to be equal in volume on all sides of the U-boat and gave no indication from which side an attack might be expected. The whereabouts of the hunting craft could, however, be determined by the U-boat's listening gear. This man said that the ASDIC transmissions of two or more attacking ships varied as the ticking of various clocks might vary. The doubling of the rate of transmissions followed by a silence warned the Germans of imminent attack, according to this prisoner, who believed that ASDICs could not function during the dropping of depth charges. When an attack appeared imminent, all possible evasion tactics were employed, such as turning and twisting diving more deeply or rising. Many men repeated the fears voiced by earlier prisoners to the effect that the ASDIC was a weapon against which the U-boats had no defense and which would ultimately prove a decisive factor in the naval war. This prisoner claimed to have heard of but not personally experienced another form of echo detection which appears to be known as canary twittering, Canarian Vogelgerausch. Because of its characteristic sound, which is also equal in volume on all sides of the U-boat, it was stated that the Germans believed that this was an American device in use in warships handed over to Great Britain by the USA. Depth when attacking Prisoners stated that U-boats were usually at a depth of 12.5 meters, or 41 feet, when attacking submerged in rough weather, and as deep as 18 meters, 59 feet when attacking submerged in dead calm. Section 17 General Remarks on U-Boats Watches on Active Service Prisoners stated that in the 500-ton type U-Boats, carrying a complement of about 5 officers and 40 men, the crew was divided into 3 watches. The 24 hours were said to be divided into seven periods, the first watch being on duty from 0800 to 1200, 
followed by the second from 1200 to 1500, and the third, 1500 to 1700. The first watch was said to come on duty again from 1700 to 2000, and then the second watch from 2000 to 2400, the third from 2400 to 0400, and finally the first watch again from 0400 to 0800. Thus, a daily variation was described as occurring in the hours during which the three watches are on duty. When action stations are ordered, a bell is rung and the entire crew must proceed at once to their appointed stations. Lookout Watches Prisoners stated that the lookout men on the conning tower were changed every two hours. Each lookout watch was said to consist of an officer, a petty officer, and two ratings, so that each man had a sector of 90 degrees. Orders regarding neutral shipping. Prisoners stated that all merchant shipping, whether British or neutral, entering the blockade area declared by Germany were to be sunk. But such neutral ships, as were proceeding with the agreement of the German government, were said to receive safe conduct and an indicated route, which was altered at frequent intervals such ships were obliged to pass through the area within certain time limits. Prisoners implied that Swedish ships availed themselves of this arrangement. Attack on American ships Prisoners said that U-boat captains had orders to attack any merchant ship, including American, which ventured into the war zone, but that it was forbidden to attack any American warship anywhere. Obligatory Submerging in Certain Areas Prisoners stated that U-boats had orders to proceed submerged in certain areas of the North Sea because of the difficulty of recognition by aircraft of friendly or enemy U-boats. It was added that the Germans claimed to have sunk 23 British submarines in the Kattegat. Escort for U-boats approaching Lorient Prisoners believed that there was a homing beacon at Lorient to assist U-boats making for that port. They stated that such U-boats were met seven or eight miles out by escort vessels which guided them through the British minefields and acted as protection against any British submarines which might be operating off Lorient. German Opinion on British Depth Charge Settings a petty officer prisoner believed that British depth charges could be set to explode at 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, and 170 meters, approximately 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and 560 feet, but not deeper. Work while in harbor. Much discontent has been caused among U-boat personnel by the regulations which require them to carry on working for two or three days after their return to harbor from a war cruise. The duties to be performed were said to include the provision of a guard for their U-boat, the returning of unused torpedoes from the containers on the upper deck, the return of all ammunition, all stores, the servicing of other remaining torpedoes, the removal of mattresses and bunks, and of everything that is not a fixture. During the whole stay in harbor, the guard for the U-boat was said to be provided by the crew. Three days before the departure of a U-boat, the crew had to replace everything removed from their ship, according to prisoners, take on torpedoes, ammunition, provisions, oil, water, and anything else required. Prisoners felt that all these duties should be performed by shore working parties and not by themselves who had to bear the rigors and dangers of active service. Testing Pressure Hulls Prisoners stated that the hulls of new U-boats were tested in an enclosed dock at Kiel where they were subjected to a pressure of 8 atmospheres which represented the pressure at a depth of 80 meters or 262.5 feet practice depth charge attacks. Prisoners stated that during trials in the Baltic, their U-boat was repeatedly subjected to depth charging from Wilhelm Bauer at a distance of 500 to 600 meters 
the object of which was to accustom the crew to being attacked. Escania Hydroplane Teacher As no prisoners had heard of this instrument, it seems unlikely that it is used for U-boat training purposes. Time Limit for Dockyard Hands Prisoners stated that strict time limits were set for the completion of dockyard jobs and that failure to finish work within the specified time rendered workmen liable to court-martial. Illnesses resulting from service in U-boats Prisoners complained of the ailments due to prolonged service in U-boats, such as rheumatism, gout, ruination of the teeth, and a particular form of kidney trouble. Dissension between Raider and Donitz It was stated that early in the war, Gross Admiral, Grand Admiral Raider, had insisted on ordering three U-boats to attempt to pass through the English Channel, and that the loss of all three resulted in a scene with Vice Admiral Dönitz, whose uncle was a friend and advisor of Hitler. Dönitz was thus able to gain Hitler's support against Raider. It is known that Dönitz is now not under Raider's orders, and is responsible direct to Hitler for the entire U-boat branch of the Navy. Italian Submarines Prisoners expressed the usual contempt for everything Italian, and added that Italian U-boat officers taken on a war cruise in a German U-boat were terrified at the German tactics and the daring of their attacks. Section 18 Remarks on Mines and Mine Sweeping Mines dropped by German aircraft. Prisoners stated that the mines dropped by German aircraft were known as the Airmine B, Luftmine B, and LMB for short, and that there were four main types, namely white, green, yellow, and blue. The white mine was said to be intended as a land mine to be dropped on land targets only. Of the other three, one was said to react to a strengthening of the magnetic field, another to the weakening of the magnetic field, and the third was described as an acoustic mine. All these mines were said to have a number of delay settings, termed VH1, VH28, VH48, or VH92, set to arm the mine after 14, 28, 48, or 92 hours respectively, or after three, four, five, or six days. In addition, these mines could be set to require one, two, or three actuations, according to prisoners. Use of Double Oropesa Sweeps A junior officer claimed to have formerly served in minesweepers engaged in clearing up the French minefields in the Bay of Biscay. He said that the sweepers using double Oropesa sweeps swept at seven knots with a sweep wire at twelve fathoms. Prisoners stated that these double Oropesa sweeps were armed with an explosive cutter placed next to the kite and contained a small explosive charge of approximately one pound. The sweepers were said to have had a degaussing cable around them. Section 19 Miscellaneous Remarks HMS Seal Prisoners said that when taken to Kiel, His Majesty's submarine Seal, now known as UB, lay for several days at the Tirpitzmoor and then near the Blücher Bridge. They added that the German flag was hoisted with the white flag below it and the white ensign below that. Prisoners believed that the provisions had given out on board and that many of the crew were suffering from dysentery when captured. They stated that the German radio had announced that the submarine had been damaged by a mine and had been unable to submerge. Prisoners claimed to have seen bullet marks on the upper works, the result of machine gun fire from the aircraft alleged to have captured her. See Confidential Book 405113, page 21. 
Swedish tankers. An officer stated that Sweden had transferred a number of tankers to Germany, but that these were slow ships not capable of more than 10 knots. Promotion in the German Navy Most prisoners in the past have expressed the dissatisfaction prevalent in the German Navy at the system of promotion by seniority and not by merit. They claim that in the Army and in the Air Force, merit had become a deciding factor, but was ignored in the Navy, except in a very few instances. Nazi Party Influence Officer prisoners severely criticized the system instigated in peacetime by which all volunteers for the Navy were drawn from the naval selection of the Hitler Youth Movement. This organization was said to have drummed unlimited political propaganda into the recruits, but to have taught them nothing of elementary practical use in the Navy. It was added that this regrettable practice was responsible for the low standard of intelligence in the German Navy today. Gross Admiral, Grand Admiral Reder. Reder was stated to be most unpopular with all ranks of the German Navy because of his extreme conservatism, obstinacy, and rigidly feudal views. In naval circles, he is held responsible for the fact that promotion from the ranks to commissioned rank, so greatly encouraged in the Army and in the Air Force, has been made extremely difficult in the Navy. It was added that Hitler now insisted on more frequent promotions from the lower deck. Prisoners stated the retirement of Reder, so ardently desired by the entire German Navy, was unlikely as the Admiral had been an old supporter of Hitler who had always been unwilling for sentimental reasons to relieve any members of the old guard of their positions. In this connection, mention of Rome and others was tactfully avoided. Lloyd's Registers Officer prisoners deplored the fact that there were only eight Lloyd's Registers in the entire German Navy, one for each of six capital ships, and two for use ashore. Retaliatory Measures Prisoners stated that Hitler had expressed strong resentment at the transportation of German prisoners of war to Canada, and had declared that, if another ship carrying prisoners were torpedoed, he would order the shooting of 500 British officer prisoners of war. Disciplinary Camp at Hella The institution, known as the Unteroffiziers Lehrbildungsete, Petty Officers Training Establishment, was stated to be, in fact, a concentration camp of the most extreme type. It was said to be controlled by the SS, who had power over life and death and practiced unbelievable cruelties. New arrivals were made to stand rigidly to attention for two hours before being beaten up. This reception was intended to impress newcomers with the fact that Hella was not a health resort. All work had to be carried out at the double and was supervised by warders who used whips freely. Trivial offenses were stated to have been punished by death. A case in point was mentioned in which a man of a Hella working party found a bullet and expressed to a companion the wish that the bullet could be used on the corporal in charge. The companion repeated the remark to the corporal and was shortly afterward released from Hella. The author of the remark was shot immediately. The hardships and cruelty suffered at Hella frequently led to the complete physical and mental collapse of the inmates and insanity often resulted, according to prisoners. It was added that such stronger men who survive to return to the service have invariably become nervous wrecks and are practically useless. Even the Germans were said to be shocked at the spectacle of an ex hella man instinctively carrying out an order at the double or hurling himself on the ground to grovel for an article dropped by his superior. Disciplinary Camp at Torgau A petty officer who had been sentenced to six weeks in the reformatory at Torgau for bringing his girlfriend on board his U-boat while at Gottenhaven 
described the appallingly harsh methods employed by the authorities of the establishment. Discipline in the German armed forces was said to be maintained by the imposition of savage sentences for comparatively slight offenses. An instance quoted was that of a petty officer who was overheard repeating a popular and somewhat derogatory pun on the name of Reder, for which he was disrated to ordinary seamen second class and condemned to Torgau for two years. Another man was said to have been imprisoned at Torgau for two years for going on leave from the naval school at Kiel five minutes before his appointed time. In this connection, it was stated that, in the period from the beginning of the war up to June 1941, there had been approximately five million convictions in the German armed forces. The majority of the inmates of Torgau were said to be German Air Force men. Gestapo A German lieutenant commander said that when Hitler appears in public in Berlin, Every third man present is a Gestapo agent. This officer stated it was intended that the Gestapo should cease to exist during the next 50 years, as by then the masses would have been educated up to a proper behavior. He considered that the higher officers who had joined the Gestapo up to about 1934 were mainly valuable and efficient men, whereas nowadays Many members were mere opportunists who had climbed to positions which they were unfit to hold. The more exclusive SS would not so much as glance at an SA man, and no decent person would willingly belong to the SA. Expulsion of Inhabitants of Gdania A German officer expressed his approval of the efficient way in which the German authorities had forced the Polish inhabitants of Gdania to flee from the captured town. Four cars fitted with loudspeakers were driven round and round the blocks of buildings in which the Poles lived, and the loudspeakers blared, This block is to be empty by 1 p.m. without fail. Each person may take 50 pounds of hand luggage and is to go to the railway station. Anyone remaining will be shot. Retaliation in Poland Officer prisoners stated that formerly 50 Poles were shot for every German shot by saboteurs, but as even such drastic retaliatory measures had failed to stop the killing of Germans, 100 Poles were now being shot for every German murdered. The wounding of a German police official was said to have been avenged by the shooting without trial of a number of Poles seized at random. Hunger in France Officer prisoners described women and children in occupied France calling out to German soldiers and begging for bread at a point on the railway line where the train had to travel slowly owing to the inadequate repairing of a damaged bridge. Foreign Labor An intelligent and observant petty officer, who had recently traveled extensively in Germany, stated that large numbers of Belgians, Czechs, Dutchmen, and Poles were now working in both public and private employment. Many of these men were said to be train conductors and waiters, and some were working in shipbuilding yards engaged in U-boat construction. It was added that 35,000 Czechs were working on the reconstruction of Warsaw and that the shortage of labor had resulted in the employment of many thousand of Central European and German Jews who were now supposed to be able to earn up to 80 Pfennig per hour in Germany. Observation book kept by the chief quartermaster with entries made in pencil ordered by date, miles on surface, miles submerged, etc. List of crew of U-651 by name, rank, English equivalent, and age, etc. 
Officers, 6. Petty Officers, 17. Men, 22. Total, 45.